Well, good afternoon, everyone. In case you didn't know, you are in Money and Macro. If you think you're in the wrong session, don't leave. You are in the best one of this afternoon, I guarantee you. My name is Pete Sepp. I am president of National Taxpayers Union, a US-based group celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, working on taxpayer rights and limited government at all levels. This panel has uh, three of the most brilliant minds in the limited government movement. And then there's me. Uh, I am not one of those minds. I'm a mouth. I'm an advocate. But I can tell you, time after time after time, the contributions of economists to our work as advocates is tremendously important. It's not theoretical. It's practical. It is timely. It is impactful. I'll give you two examples from my own experience. Right now, one of the great equalizers in our current debate in the United States over free trade against those who are espousing protectionism is a letter signed by 1,113 economists, including 12 Nobel laureates, calling on the Trump administration to give up on its trade war philosophy. And it's helping us to push back. It's getting us news coverage. It's getting us noticed in Congress. One of the most popular videos on our website is an interview with the late, great Milton Friedman on the perils of US antitrust law and the development of technological innovation. Again, economists make a difference at the ground level of fiscal policy. And these gentlemen are proof positive that it can happen every single day. I'll introduce our panelists first. Professor Tony Macon, uh, professor and director of the Apex Study Center at Griffith University, consulting economist to the IMF Institute, Treasury, government agencies. And here again, Here's where the theoretical meets the practical and has an impact. I was able to read his uh, co-authored study on the optimal size of government in Australia. Uh, bottom line, it needs to be closer to your trading partners in the region, and you've got about 6% of spending reduction as a percent of GDP to achieve that. Very important lesson for policymakers as they budget. Again, real world impact. Now, in the middle, we have uh, Professor Richard Holden, uh, University of New South Wales, Professor of Economics, taught at the University of Chicago. Hooray, fantastic institution. And uh, I was reading an interesting column he had in the Australian Financial Times, cutting the Australian company tax rate is not just good for business and workers, it also helps to redress economic inequality. Right on, fantastic. Very useful information to policymakers who think that they can score political points by calling for confiscatory tax rates on American businesses. Also at the end here, Professor Sinclair Davidson, Professor of Institutional Economics at RMIT University, Adjunct Academic Fellow or just plain academic fellow at Institute of Public Affairs, Australian Taxpayers Alliance and Consumer Choice Center. He was just at another panel doing double duty today. Fantastic. Well, here's something ripped right from the headlines. Uh, he wrote an IPA uh, a analysis. Labor's franking credits plan adds up to a nana tax. That was obviously one of the biggest issues in the election, and that kind of analysis made a difference at the polls. And uh, I have to also compliment you, sir. I, I came across a great paper you wrote on the awful subject of interchange fees. I'm taking that home with me and giving it to uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve with whom I'm meeting in about two more weeks, so bravo. Bravo, made it worth the airline ticket to come here. So gentlemen, please do give us the benefit of your wisdom in the limited time we have, uh, starting with Professor Macon. Give him a hand. Thank you, Pete. 
If I may start by paraphrasing a former Labor Prime Minister. Hello, my name is Tony, I'm from Queensland, and our state helped prevent the election of a very un like federal government last weekend. As we know, the federal election was about many things, but at the most fundamental level, it was about how big a role government should play in the economy and in our lives more broadly. At issue for electors was whether the role and size of government should expand with more spending, as proposed by the uh, ALP, or remain much the same as proposed by the LNP, emphasis on remain much the same. So uh, as we know, uh, aware that significantly higher taxes had to be paid to achieve the uh, opposition's bigger government objective, the, the elect electorate narrowly favoured the, the LNP's position. So I'm going to talk today about uh, the size of government and um, expand on the paper that Pete's mentioned there that he'd seen. Uh, just highlight some features of that. It's, a, it's an ongoing project uh, that, I'm, that I'm working on. And talk about the government size. It's a macro topic because I'm talking about the relationship between government size and economic growth. So in macroeconomics, there's been an absolute flourishing of uh, studies on fiscal policy with the GFC. We've seen a mountain of studies, um, mainly empirical, not much theory has come to light, but mainly empirical studies about, about multipliers. If I see another paper on the multiplier, I'll pull, pull a few more hairs out. It's just an absolute mountain of um, studies on that. And, it, and in the end, it's, it's all a bit inconclusive. But well, there's very little attention to the impact of the size of government and how that impacts on the economy uh, going forward. So I'm going to talk about some perspectives uh, on the causes and consequences of the growth of government and talk about a trade-off that exists between higher government spending and the rate of economic growth. <coughs> So economics began as, a, as, a, as an inquiry into the sources of, of growth. Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations is a macroeconomic title, if ever there was one. What, uh, what causes economies to grow and become richer? So talk about some of the, um, the, the, the key trade-off there, which I think should be hammered at first level economics in every class of uh, economics around the world, but it, it, it tends not to be, uh, missing from the curriculum. Talk about some trends in Australian government spending and then say a little bit about some, some work on you know, what the optimal size of, of government is for Australia. So it is interesting to look at the, the trends in the growth of government. And it was largely a last century phenomenon that the government grew inexorably uh, through that century. At the beginning of the, the 1900s, the size of government was about 10% of GDP. The First World War saw it ratchet up because of the war itself, but when government spending ratchets up, it, it tends not to come back down again. And then the Great Depression meant that there was a further increase, there was limited welfare provision at the time, uh, again not rewound. Second World War increased again. But the big spurt occurred really in the, from the 1960s onwards with the, the growth of the welfare state. And this was at odds with the writings of the classical economists, Bar Marx of course, but uh, classical economists, Adam Smith, um, Ricardo and uh, John Stuart Mill talked about government playing a basic role um, and that was to provide uh, essential services, national defence, justice system, law enforcement, basic education. But we saw a, a, a big departure from that classical perception of economics throughout the, um, the last century. And interestingly, this mainly occurred in the uh, Western Europe, uh, less so in the United States, less so as it turns out in Australia uh, and, and Japan. So we now see that there's a bit of a 
a dichotomy in terms of size of government in the advanced economies, particularly when we compare the advanced economies in our own region where Australia does most of its trade, the size of government is around 20% as opposed to the size of government in advanced economies, which is, which is far greater. So this chart here shows that um, this middle line is Australia. These are the um, advanced economies in Asia. And uh, the top line is, is uh, advanced economies generally biased by some big spenders, France, 56, 57% of GDP, uh, Italy, Greece, and so on, uh, big shares of government. So why does government grow? Well, there are some theories, that, theories been proposed over the years. Uh, Wagner's law was the uh, first exposition of, of a rationale for the growth of government. Uh, German economist, unfortunately also named uh, uh, Adolf, Adolf uh, Wagner's law uh, explained that as economies develop, the size of government would grow um, because economies became more complex. Urbanisation meant the need for, for infrastructure uh, and so on. We have also seen theories that suggest that there is this ratchet effect, as I've mentioned, that when government spending increases, then it tends not to, to be wound back. And uh, amongst the causes of that ratcheting has been the active use of Keynesian stabilisation policy, government stepping in to spend during economic downturns, but then tending not to, to wind back on that. And lastly, uh, a, th a theory worth mentioning is the so-called Baumol effect, which says that government spending will uh, become bigger proportionately due to uh, different, different differential productivity and government workers get paid the same as private sector workers, but that tends to expand the absolute size. So the more of a microeconomic um, explanation, but let's focus on the macro and think about the, the main linkages between government spending and the broader economy. So we can think about debt funded government spending, how that affects the economy. If it's debt funded, we're gonna have influences on the financial sector through interest rates, which is gonna crowd out private investment, it's gonna affect the real exchange rate variously defined as either the conventional way or as the ratio of the price of non-tradables to tradables. Either way, you're gonna see an, a worsening of competitiveness, which means that you're gonna be shrinking your tradable sector, which is the sector that is uh, likely to be the most competitive in the economy. And that has implications for long-term growth. And if it is debt funded, you're gonna have this big overhang of public debt, which is gonna feed back and harm confidence, business confidence, and household confidence. And I think we've clearly seen that post-GFC, the weak investment that's been going on, no doubt uh, reflects that, that factor. And then in open economies, because uh, foreign debt can uh, so public debt can be largely foreign debt as well, has to be serviced. And in Australia's case, we're seeing some $12, 13000000000 billion of interest paid abroad every year, which is um, greater than that paid on unemployment benefits, greater than that paid on three or four times the foreign aid budget just in debt servicing, which is reducing national income. So debt finance, public debt has those effects. Tax funded because fully covered uh, by tax increases, then obviously if you get a higher uh, tax take as a proportion of GDP, this is gonna feed through incentives, incentives to work and invest, which is going to reduce the growth of the capital stock and hence, uh, and hence economic growth. And I think this is a, a fundamental reason why we're not seeing the strong wage growth uh, post GFC because we haven't had the investment for these sort of reasons and hence we haven't had the increase in productive capital which is necessary to, um, to, to for, for higher wages. So for all those reasons um, higher government spending as a share of GDP is going to affect the growth rate suggesting there is a trade-off between 
growth and the share of government spending. And this little device here is something I think that all first year students should, should learn, the so-called bars curve, it goes under various names, but basically shows that as you increase the size of government moving in this direction, um, then you're going to have an impact on the growth rate of the economy itself. So you do need some government spending, as the classical, uh, classical economists espouse. You do need to have government spending that ensures that you have uh, property rights um, uh, enforced, that you have the rule of law, that you have defence and so on. And so uh, as government spending increases, that's compatible with increasing the rate of growth. But there's a point beyond that uh, optimum where increased government spending is going to reduce the economy's rate of growth for those reasons I've just, just talked about. So an economy can have a suboptimal rate of growth uh, either because government is too small, and that may be the case in some developing economies, uh, or in the case of advanced economies, the rate of growth is suboptimal because the size of government is too big. So what of Australia's experience? Well, we see here that um, the biggest spike in government spending was uh, with the election of the Whitlam government uh, back in uh, 1972, big spike here. What we see in the data is that the size of government, I'm talking about government at all, government spending at all levels, that is uh, federal, state and local, uh, state and local uh, always put together because the state governments um, are responsible for local governments. But what we see is that the, um, what's the swing factor, if you like, is the federal government. Right? So this is the picture, big increase during the Whitlam years, uh, some variation along the way. The biggest uh, consolidation actually happened through the Hawke-Keating years, uh, thanks to Finance Minister Peter Walsh essentially. Um, caused uh, or was responsible for a bigger uh, cutback in government spending than has ever occurred under an LNP government, including under uh, Peter Costello. So we've seen that post GFC, uh, well this was GFC here, the spike due to the um, overblown fiscal stimulus of the Rudd government, Rudd Swan, but we've not seen really much pairing back of that of that spending. So another way of looking at how this spending is determined is to look at the, um, the initiatives of the, um, of the governments. Right? So this is a breakdown by governments here and you can see uh, Peter Walsh's good work during the whole uh, Keating era uh, where government spending was actually reduced significantly, recessions, spikes up, Costello did this, but then we had family benefits and so on, which caused this big increase under, <coughs> under John Howard's government. And then we had the massive overspend by, by Rudd and Swan at this point. We see that ever since there hasn't really been a lot of consolidation. So Abbott and Hockey copped a lot of criticism for their so-called tight budget um, on the election of the Abbott government, but um, there hasn't really been sustained serious cutback in government spending. So the argument would be that we need government spending because that allows for uh, more equitable distribution of income and also that it allows for provision of key public goods in the areas of <coughs> health and education. But when we look at the Human Development Index that is published by the United Nations, which is a composite index. It takes into account national income, but it also takes into account uh, the standard of health services and education services. We see that on that index, Australia ranks in the top two there, ties with Switzerland, Norway number one. Now, if you do a, a correlation analysis of this, there's actually a negative correlation. The higher the size of, of government, the, uh, the less uh, the less well the country performs on this index measure. So here we see Greece, for instance, coming in at number 26, has a very high share of, of government. So it's not the size of the spend that matters, it's the quality of the spend when we're talking about those sorts of indicators. 
So as I said, we've got uh, a project ongoing. There's a paper that was, has been published um, recently that looks at this relationship, uh, that so-called bars curve, econometrically. And it concludes, and I won't spend any time talking about the econometrics uh, of, of the paper, which is something I don't understand much anyway. <laughs> but uh, it concludes that Australia should have a um, a size of government, optimal size of government, at 31%, which is very close to the, uh, the Centre for Independent Studies, 30%, as it turns out. Um, the corollary of that result, and another uh, result, another result that was included uh, in that study was that a 10% increase in the size of government reduces economic growth by by 1%. So a corollary of that is that if you cut government spending by that much, you'll increase GDP, GDP growth by 1%. That is a 10% cut in government spending, a 1% increase in economic growth. And that's an, an enormous ask. Uh, that would just be politically infeasible to take it from the current 37 down to 27. Um, but a 5% cut uh, is not outside of the bounds of possibility. And that would add um, a half a percent to growth each year, which compounded through uh, can be quite significant in terms of higher income for the economy. Okay, so thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. I'm gonna to talk about something called modern monetary theory or MMT, which if, you're in the United States, you almost surely will have heard of. If you're in Australia, you might not have, but more people in this room, I guess this is a pretty selected crowd. So um, you may well have heard of that. So I think that the context, before I try and explain what it is, which is pretty hard because the proponents of it don't make it very clear, um, let me put it in some sort of context of the debate. So. Um, one of the sort of key people associated with this movement is an economist called Stephanie Kelton, who is Bernie Sanders' chief economic advisor. Um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has come out in favour, or I should say at AOC has come out in favour of it. Um, and I think in the context of the, the United States debate, it potentially provides a rationale for how you would fund the Green New Deal and a jobs guarantee, okay? Uh, and, and I understand that there probably aren't going to be too many people in this room who are in favour of those things, and I'm certainly not, but, um, but there are a number of people running for the Democratic presidential nomination who are supportive of those things, and, you know, at some point that's going to raise the question of how do you pay for it, uh, and it turns out something along the lines of free money would be very handy in that regard. Um, so let me, I'm going to describe, so, so let me try and describe uh, what MMT is. And that's not a particularly easy task for reasons I'll get into. But l let me just say there's been recent, um, there was a recent article by Larry Summers in the Washington Post being critical of MMT, um, you know, a Democrat. Um, there was two recent pieces in the New York Times or on his blog by Paul Krugman. Uh, being very critical of it. Paul wrote a couple of years ago a piece on his blog being very critical of it. Um, I had never heard of it until a few years ago, maybe four and a half, five years ago. Uh, I write this weekly column for an online publication called The Conversation, and they have comments. And um, as I started writing, I thought, well, maybe I'll see what some of the comments are like. Um, and they're pretty wild. But I wrote something saying something pretty sort of centrist about economics. I can't recall what it was. And there were hundreds of comments about you're in neoclassical four letter word, you're such an idiot, you don't know any economics. You know, having a PhD from Harvard's one thing, but apparently it doesn't count. Um, and then there was this whole raft of you clearly don't know anything about MMT, and here's some links, and you should read them. So I was like, 
Yeah, I never heard of the thing. I mean, it's not on any syllabus in any major US PhD program or anything like that. So what is this thing? Um, and then I guess I became a bit of a lightning rod for these types because it was really, my comment section became a discussion board for them where they didn't really care about what I wrote. They just said, oh, you know, this guy's a jerk and MMT is really cool. And then they sort of debated MMT. So after about a year and a half of this, I got fed up and decided to, so I read all the stuff and I decided to write something. And I wrote, it was harsh, um, harshly critical of MMT. And that got, I think the comments section got shut down after two hours at 1,000 comments and none of them were polite. Um, so let me tell you what I think MMT is. Now, part of the problem with trying to tell you what it is, is it's not a formal economic theory, okay? So there's no math, there's no model, there's prose. And one of the reasons uh, economists use mathematics and formal models is it provides a language for kind of checking logic. And that's pretty handy in economics and it's especially handy in macroeconomics where a lot of things going on at the same time and you want to make sure that the trail of logic is as good as you can. That doesn't mean all mathematical models are good by any means, but it's handy. So it's not written in a formal way. So whenever one criticises it, the response, and Krugman's written about this as well, the response comes out, we never said that. And so in his recent exchange with Stephanie Counton, Paul said, well, okay, what did you say? And she said something, and he said, it sounds like I want yes or no answers to the following four questions. Uh, and she gave four, in my view, internally inconsistent, logically flawed answers to those questions. So it's very hard to actually understand what people are saying. But the best, um, probably the thing that's closest to it is uh, a theory was written by an economist, Arthur Lerner, in 1943 uh, that's called functional finance. And I think this shares all the key elements of what the MMP types are trying to say. It basically says the following. So if you print your own money, if you control your own fiat currency, and you borrow in that currency and not in uh, a foreign currency, then you don't face any debt constraints because you can always just print more money to pay off your debts. Now you think about that for a nanosecond and you're gonna say, yeah, but that's gonna to lead to inflation, okay? Um, so you do face an inflation constraint. And the MMT crowd variously say, no, you don't, or yes, you do, but that's the whole point of it. So I think to be fair to Stephanie Kelton, she says, yeah, you face an inflation constraint. And Lerner certainly said that um, as well. So the conclusion of that is you should just focus on, you know, creating full employment or something um, and not, uh, and, but at the same time making sure you haven't triggered runaway inflation. Okay, now that has a few problems. So the first, and so I'm gonna set that up as what I understand MMT to be and then say, well, I think that's problematic. And it's certainly the most logically laid out version of any of the stuff that's been written that I'm aware of. So part of the problem is learner's theory and the subsequent work is completely silent on monetary policy. And if you're not at what we call the zero lower bound, if you're not at zero interest rates, then monetary policy is actually a pretty useful tool for stabilising the economy. And that's what's been used in most modern economies for you know, the last several decades in order to do that. You cut interest rates from 7% to 6% and that changes economic activity. And it's completely silent on this channel. The second problem I think is that it doesn't deal with debt snowballing. So at some point this debt's gonna get very big as you keep printing all this money to fund, to fund the debt. Um, and to, to, and, and Lerner is kind of dismissive of this for no seemingly good reason. And just to put that in perspective, if your interest rate was one and a half percent above the growth rate of your economy, it's not an unreasonable thing to think, then you'd have to run a four and a half percent primary surplus. So a, a surplus before we're paying interest, just to, just to be able to make any impression on that. Um, and that's 
rarely been done. It has been done in some economies at some points in time, but it's rarely been done. And I think the key thing here is, if you put in a jobs guarantee in the Green New Deal in the US, you're not going to run a 4.5% primary surplus. So are you really going to take those things away that you used this supposed tool to do? Or are you going to get rid of Medicare in the US? Or abolish Social Security? It seems politically inconceivable to me that any of those things would happen. I mean, it would be kind of political suicide for anyone to do it. So it seems hard to see how you don't run into this big debt snowballing effect. Now, the other thing is inflation. When, now, whenever I write about this and say something about Weimar Germany and Venezuela, people go absolutely bananas um, and say they were special cases. I think I said in one of the pieces, you know, this leads to the destruction of all savings of the economy, hyperinflation, and in some notable cases, world war. Um, and sure, that's a cherry-picked example, but it's not an un... I mean, it had pretty bad consequences, right? So if we're going to run a small percentage probability of something like that happening again, that concerns me. But I think, it, more to the point, this has happened all across Latin America, and it happened in France under Mitterrand in 1981, and he had to reverse course very quickly to prevent inflation getting out of control. It happened in 1998 in Germany under Gerhard Schroeder. And in the 70s, it's sometimes forgotten that Italy and the UK had to get an IMF bailout because of their inflation, um, inflationary problems and debt. So I, I think that this is not, it's not inconceivable that you're going to get runaway inflation. And it might be Venezuela style if you've got a certain political system or it might get to 25% and then you're in a lot of trouble and have to unravel a lot of things. That's very costly as well. But I think the idea that it only happened, you know, it, it can only happen if associated with, um, with uh, the Hitler regime is, is certainly misguided. Um, you know, there are a number of other problems that happen with it. It, um, it would trigger a huge, just even if it was running kind of smoothly, it would trigger a huge exchange rate um, devaluation. That creates more inflation, raises long-term interest rates, um, and, and would lead to a lot of capital flight. Okay, so uh, the MMT crowd on, the, on all of these things, just, I mean, their honest response, when you say that, they say, that's not what we say. Um, and that's part of why I think it's um, so dangerous. The debate on this is really completely, it's not a debate, okay? It's like chimps hurling feces at one another. Um, you know, it's that quality level. And so there is no real debate about this. And one wouldn't be too, I, one wouldn't be too concerned about that if um, this didn't seem to have captured the attention of someone who has a, I don't know what, 20% chance, 10, 15% chance of being president of the United States in Bernie Sanders. Um, and it's just concerning that it's got that level of, of traction, I think. Now, the, the people who are proponents of this are pretty much on the fringe of the economics profession. Now, they don't like, I understand why they don't like to hear people say that. Um, and, but it's true. And none of these things have ever been published in any mainstream good journals or mainstream bad journals for that matter. And these folks think that's all a conspiracy and the kind of Nobel Prize club are just against them. But I, I think there is something to be said for the fact that you've got Larry Summers and Paul Krugman and Bob Schiller. I mean, these aren't hard school Chicago school economists. Being, thinking this is an important enough issue that they are willing to pick a fight on the op-ed pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post. And, you know, they, they've been criticised for this and said they were being very harsh, but I think that tells you how they feel about how concerning it is. Um, now, as I say, I think it's a profoundly dangerous idea. It doesn't seem to have gotten any traction in Australia. Um, it's It's... You know, it's obviously not going to be um, Liberal Party, you know, a Liberal Party idea. It's also inconceivable to me that it would be 
a Labor Party idea, whatever you think of the tax policies of the election, the economic team in the Labor Party at the moment are far too sensible to ever contemplate anything like this. It will get no traction with, within that party. Um, one can imagine the... Well, maybe we can talk about that later. Um, maybe we can talk about the, the Australian Greens, you know, thinking it might be a good idea. But so I, I'm less worried about it as a dangerous idea in Australia, but I'd be terrified if anyone did propose it in a serious way. Um, but it's a very concerning thing um, in the United States. And I think it should also be noted that I think it's sort of a nice way to put the concerns of, of the people who advocate this um, many of the people, you know, le less extreme than Bernie Sanders, like Kamala Harris or Joe Biden, you know, who are running um, for the Democratic Party nomination, is they think that in a really low interest rate environment, there could be some important spending on, say, infrastructure in the United States that could be valuable. Now, you may not agree with that. You may think that's wasteful. You may think it crowds out private expenditure. That, that's a valid debate to have. Um, but I think what's really important is that people who just believe that government maybe should spend like what they do now or a fraction more or some more in a, in a recession, um, that those people shouldn't give in to this idea. You don't have to believe this to believe that you should do those things. Thank you very much. Okay, so good afternoon and uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, I, I try to avoid uh, talking about MMT as well, um, but uh, I, I always understood that you solve the inflation problem through taxation. So you tax people to stop inflation, which is all very strange. Um, but yes, yes, it's always good fun. I'm actually going to talk about the, the recent election, um, economics and democracy. So uh, uh, we've got built into our, our slides what I'm going to talk about today to, to let you all know. Uh, but anyway, but, but more importantly, I'm just going to make the rather obvious point, uh, it's the economy stupid. Um, or uh, if you are in the Labour Party, it's the stupid economy. Um, the, I, 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 I totally agree with Richard that uh, I don't think Chris Bowen and Andrew Lee would ever uh, uh, countenance MMT. But uh, I also have to say I'm, I'm underwhelmed by, by that particular team. I, I don't think they're as good as everybody thinks. I don't think they're as good as they should be. Um, but uh, the, the, the real question that got asked, I think, last weekend was the Ronald, the Ronald Reagan question. And the Ronald Reagan question, paraphrased for Australian terms, is are you better off now than what you were three years ago? And and we can, we can quibble, we can say yes, no, maybe, we can talk about stagnant wages. Uh, um, Craig Emerson had a great op-ed in the Fin Review a few weeks ago where he was kind of saying, you know, it's all very well the government talking about uh, the employment figures, but it's stagnant wages that are really important. And if you had a job in 2013 when the government came to power and you've still got a job today, what have you got? And he's kind of suggesting, well, you didn't have very much because your wages hadn't gone up. But actually, you had a job. Um, that's not nothing. I mean, so it, it, it was, I, I think the, the, the opposition struggled with, with that particular question, even though it pro probably wasn't posed in those terms. Um, are you better off? And yeah, most people probably were better off, or at least they weren't worse off than what they had been before. So the, the kind of narrative that, 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 that uh, uh, the opposition were making for change kind of failed on, on that particular score. Now, we keep on hearing that the Labour Party is the party of reform in Australia, and uh, I suspect this is true. Um, they have reformed, they certainly reformed the economy in the 1980s, uh, magnificent work under, under the former Prime Minister Hawke. But generally speaking, when people are proposing reforms, they actually make what Harold Emsitz calls the Nirvana fallacy. And the Nirvana fallacy is a series of assumptions that people make. And the first one is, is that the grass is greener on the other side. So something has to be done. This is something. Let's do it. It will automatically work. The other argument that people make is that there will always be a free lunch. And finally, people will be different, is that they will see our way of doing things. They will, they will change their minds. They will, the scales will fall from their eyes, and they will be enlightened by our wisdom. Um, and uh, certainly, these are the kind of mistakes that people make all the time, certainly when making policy. Is Certainly when you are an honours graduate from a group of eight university in Australia who gets bright young thing, gets employed by all government agencies and they go in and they make all these mistakes. I was at the Treasury during the mining tax debates talking to them about the bad idea of taxing rent and um, one of the young bright things slammed the table. He said to me, you're just saying people don't want to pay tax. 
I said, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's what I'm saying. Um, and was like horrified uh, that, that, that anybody would suggest that uh, people don't want to pay tax and this is a bad thing. <laughs> um, but here we have it. Uh, the, the problem mainstream economics makes, especially neoclassical economics, is it does democracy very badly. Um, the idea that you can design a, an efficient economy, an optimal economy, that you can take the first differences of everything and set it to equal zero and so on and so forth, you can design an economy from the bottom up or the top down as the case may be, is very, very popular in economic analysis and it runs into the democracy problem which James Buchanan said very nicely, um, economists enjoy playing God. They set out their vision for the world, for the rest of us, without worrying about how they're actually going to get these policies elected. And we see a lot of this in taxation policy, and we saw a lot of this last weekend. Um, so here are some bad policies that uh, we, we saw last weekend. Um, the negative gearing changes. Um, the, uh, the whole idea that somehow expenditure incurred in the production of taxable income is itself not deductible, um, that, that there was some sort of tax rort or that it was a strange idea, it was unusual, um, it was, was actually quite strange to me. Um, if you start off thinking about tax taxation policies from an Adam Smith perspective, you start off with these four maxims of taxation, and one of them is that you must be able to pay the tax. And if your profit rate is, if, if you actually have a, uh, um, a turnover tax, which effectively um, the, the, uh, a lot of left-wing parties kind of advocate, if you had this turnover tax, if your profit rate was less than the tax rate, you would actually be taxed out of business. You'd be unable to pay the, 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 uh, um, uh, the, the taxation, you'd be unable to run your business. Um, so the, the negative gearing changes were certainly an attack on small business. Now a lot of people don't appreciate that being a landlord is one of the very few small businesses most Australians can undertake. You can actually buy a house, if you can get together $50,000, you can go to the bank and you can borrow $500,000 if you were going to buy a property. If you get together $50,000 and you're going to speculate on the stock market, you can go to the bank and maybe borrow another $10,000. So you can leverage yourself up by buying property and this is one of the ways in which you can get ahead as a small business person. Um, so the, the, the whole idea that, that, that somehow we could change negative gearing, that uh, a change in negative gearing wasn't driving uh, um, um, housing, uh, sorry, wasn't driving investment in, in property, well, negative gearing is not designed as an incentive to, 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 to property development. It is actually a principle of taxation, very straightforward. Um, they're, they're, so they made dreadful mistakes there. The franking credit changes. Now, this one's far more fascinating. So franking credits are actually a really good idea. It avoids double taxation in Australia, one of the great reforms of the Hawke era. But what the Hawke era did was sort of rough and ready. If your franking credits um, didn't exhaust your full uh, um, tax liability, you lost your excess franking credit. So that was tough. Um, and that's a rough and ready decision, a bit of rough justice, which we can all justify. Quite rightly, the Howard government in 2001, I think it was, actually said, we will refund the full amount. Now, as a general principle, government writing checks is normally a bad idea. So at the time, I kind of thought, you know, I, I can live with the, you know, the, the excess credits get exhausted, but in, on principle, you should get all your money back. But this means the government is writing checks. And I think we can quibble, good, bad, what have you. But nonetheless, this is a poison pill. You want to say to a future government, stop writing those checks. Stop writing checks to my nana, my grandmother who uses the money to go on holidays, or as people are now talking about, certainly in some more affluent areas of Australia, are using the money to subsidise their grandchildren's private school fees. Um, so if that's what you are doing, well, you're not just taking money away from Nana, you're actually destroying the future of our children who go to private schools and so on and so forth. So also, not particularly smart idea. Um, carbon policy, one of my favourites. Um, yes. Carbon policy has destroyed Malcolm Turnbull's career twice. It destroyed the Gillard government. Um, it's, it, it is a killer. Um, the bottom line here is we can quibble, the planet's warming up, it's cooling down, it's going sideways, whatever's happening to the planet. We can also say, well, irrespective of what, what we think about global warming per se, there is no agreement what, if anything, we should do about it. 
And certainly we don't want to have smart young things from the group of eight universities honours degree programs telling us that we're all going to pay more tax. Well, I certainly do not want to pay more tax. I don't care what is happening. Um, I am not paying more tax for this. Um, we saw this go down in a ball of flames in 2000. 12, uh, the Gillard government and the Rudd government got thrown out of office. Um, we're seeing this come up in the United States. Very recently, people are now talking about the idea of a, I think it's a carbon dividend. So all the revenue that's used from the carbon tax is going to be paid back to people. Well, we actually tried that. We, we were going to spend the money. In, in 2012, the carbon tax was told to us to be budget neutral. What would happen was the government was going to spend all the money. Well, that's the whole purpose, surely. But yes, yeah, so um, it, it, it's, it's not clear to me that uh, this is a good idea. But certainly what was definitely the killer, uncosted. Yeah. Now, there's one thing we do know from the 2012 uh, um, exercise of the carbon tax. It was astonishingly expensive. It was going to be very, very, very expensive. And the reason they didn't want to tell us again is because it's going to be very, very, very expensive and people don't want very, very expensive stuff. Now, we can also argue a lot of the changes that they brought. So uh, uh, um, Bowen is a smart guy. Um, Andrew Lee is very uh, a smart guy. Um, and that may have been good policy, scare quotes, good policy from a mainstream perspective, but not necessarily from a mainline perspective. Um, and certainly, uh, when you hear a lot of debates in Australia, I actually say to around taxation, I say to people, more people should read uh, Brennan and Buchanan's book, The Power to Tax. This whole idea that we should get rid of loopholes, we should get rid of all changes, we should get rid of rorts and what have you, and have a, a broader base and a lower rate and what have you, is propaganda. Okay? An economy breathes through its tax loopholes and should continue to do so. Raising tax should be expensive. It should be painful because otherwise they are going to take more of our money. And we should always have spend our own money. So um, the case for tax cuts. So here are some data I've been collecting since the early noughties. Uh, when Wayne Swan, in those days the shadow treasurer, came out and said um, that more and more of the tax burden was being picked up by low income earners. And what I did there was I've separated out the bottom 25% uh, of taxpayers, the top 25% of taxpayers, and the middle 50%. And the top 25% of taxpayers are the red line. In those days they were paying about 63% of uh, net income tax. They're now paying close to 70% of net income tax. Um, when those numbers came out, Wayne Swan responded by saying I was a Neanderthal who should go back to the dark ages where I belonged. Um, which just shows you he knows less about human history than he does about economics, which is an astonishing feat all by itself. Um, but <clears throat> very similar to, to, to what Tony showed you, this is from the budget papers, uh, the, uh, um, the appendix, right at the bottom of, of a budget paper A or 1, whatever it's called. And on budget night, this is the first thing I look at. I never look at the assumptions underpinning the budget, what have you, because that's also just propaganda. Um, this number is, is, is what I look at. And what I've got there is spending and revenue of percent of GDP all the way back to 1970 all the way up to the end of the forward estimates. And what the dotted line are, so the, the blue line is revenue, the red line is spending. The dotted blue line is the long-term average, and the dotted red line is the long-term average of spending. Australia runs on average a budget deficit, um, and that's more or less a structural deficit. The solution to this is not more taxation, but to cut spending. I have a list um, which uh, the Institute of Public Affairs has suppressed. Even my own copy was taken away when I put out my list of spending cuts. Um, this was also during the Wayne Swan era when he said he was struggling to find $4 billion worth of spending cuts. In 20 minutes, I had $35 billion. Um, just Anyway, so um, yeah, 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 Roskam was not amused. Um, but anyway, um, so we, we're running a long-term budget deficit more or less, but look at the blue line where it is now. It is well, well above the uh, long-term average of revenue for Australia. Look where the red line is now, also above the long-term spending average. So we are actually paying effectively more tax than we have been in the past. Um, and bearing in mind, this is in a sluggish economy. This is an economy with stagnant wage growth and all this sort of stuff. So we're actually paying a hell of a lot of tax. And that blue line needs to come down to the long-term average. And of course, the red line needs to come down even faster. And uh, as I say, I have a list. <laughs> 
Um, so, repeating myself from two years ago, I was looking through all my slides of what I've done at the Friedman Conference, and Tim's been very nice to invite me every single year, and I, I tend most years to say something very similar. Um, I've never been asked to repeat my line that we should abolish the Commonwealth of Australia and all the states should become independent. Um, I don't know why people don't like that idea. But um, what, I, what I said about taxation uh, two years ago, I repeat again today, don't believe statements you hear about taxation that are A, commonly held, and B, are pronounced by experts, especially neoclassical economists. Um, check the statements yourself. So on neoclassical economists, I wore my Hayek shirt. Um, more Hayek and Mises. Oops, we're gone, sorry. Um, I, I probably stood on the thing. But anyway, so check the statements yourself. One of the things about negative gearing that we hear all the time is people deliberately lose money. Well, no, nobody deliberately loses money, but early bu businesses in the early stage of startup lose money. I actually checked the profit rate for landlords using ATO data and compared that to the profit rate of small businesses in Australia, and it's more or less the same. Nobody says small businesses of Australia are deliberately losing money in order to rot the tax system. Well, that's exactly what happens for uh, landlords. So check statements yourself, check the data yourself. In Australia, there are very few, if any, sources of untaxed revenue. They tax everything. Okay, there is no sources of untaxed revenue in Australia. And there are very few, if any, easy policy changes that will generate large amounts of tax revenue. So that's also just not going to happen. So when Mr. Bowen comes along and says, gee, there's $11 billion of money on the table that we just, the small tweak and all of a sudden it'll flow into, into revenue, is simply not true. Um, one of my criticisms of Mr. Bowen is that he is not, he doesn't stress test his ideas enough. Paul Keating would never make the kind of mistakes Chris Bowen makes. Peter Costello would never make those kind of mistakes. Mr. Bowen makes mistake after mistake after mistake. I've done well out of him. Um, his fuel watch fiasco uh, and so on and so forth. It all goes back. I've followed his career for a long time. Um, he makes silly mistakes. Anyway, and on that note, thank you very much.